So, uh, first of all, a noble disciple uh, recollects the Buddha, the Atagata. Yeah? So, this is the first one. This is the beginning of the six recollections. Uh, because, as I said, the Buddha is like the beginning of Buddhism. It's the start of everything. Uh, and if you understand the Buddha, then really you understand everything. All the other things kind of fall into place uh, as a consequence. Uh, so, re you recollect the, the, the Atagata. So, what does this mean? Uh, and what it means is what comes now. And uh, this uh, is something that is very, uh, a very important part of Buddhism. And you will recognize this straight away. Uh, yeah, that blessed one is perfected. Uh, first thing. Uh, a fully awakened Buddha. Second thing. Uh, accomplished and knowledge and conduct. Uh, holy. Holy is an interesting translation. But anyway, holy. Knower of the world, uh, supreme guide for those who wish to train, uh, teacher of gods and humans, uh, awakened and blessed. Uh, yeah, so this is this very famous formula that you see in the suttas, itipiso bhagava arahang, samma sambuddho, etc. And so this is how the Buddha says we should recollect him. Yeah, so because of that, this is worthy of quite a bit of attention to try to understand what the Buddha is talking about here. What happens if we are successful with this recollection is the following. When a noble disciple recollects the realized one, the mind is not full of greed, hate, and delusion. In fact, it is uh, at least things are absent, in fact. At that time, the mind is unswerving based on the realized one. It is straight based on the realized one. A noble disciple whose mind is unswerving finds inspiration in the meaning and the teaching and finds joy connected with the teaching. When they're joyful, rapture springs up. When the mind is full of rapture, the body becomes tranquil. When the body is tranquil, they feel bliss. And when they feel uh, they're blissful, the mind becomes still there. Have you seen this before? Huh? Remember this from yesterday? Yeah, good. I'm glad I. So, um, um, so uh, this is this very standard way of uh, seeing the mind, how the mind develops in meditation. Yeah, it's found everywhere. It is also found here. And now you can see the connection. Now you can see why uh, the, the purpose of uh, building up or developing this idea of a recollection of the Buddha. It is to make samadhi possible. Yeah, it gives rise to that initial joy and happiness at the beginning. And then samadhi is the outcome of that. Uh, so this is the purpose. Uh, now it's kind of falling into place. Now you know why I'm talk talking about this. Uh, this is called a noble disciple who lives in balance among people who, is, who are unbalanced uh, and lives untroubled among people who are troubled. Uh, they've entered the stream of the teaching and developed the recollection of the Buddha. So that is the recollection of the Buddha. Let's go back to the beginning again now. This is just to give an overview, yeah? Now we come back to the beginning. Yeah? But firstly, a noble disciple recollects the Buddha. Now, um, what does it mean exactly to recollect the Buddha? Well, it means to have an understanding for who the Buddha was as a person, yeah? This is kind of one of the things that this is about. Uh, we're trying to connect with the Buddha. We're trying to see the Buddha as our teacher. We're trying to understand what is going on. Uh, and uh, if you do connect to the Buddha in the right way, uh, then it means that you, uh, uh, you, you kind of, that connection actually is very powerful. It was interesting. I was in Sri Lanka not so long ago. It was a couple of weeks before I came here. Uh, and in the Sri Lanka, when I was there, I did similar kind of suttas. I, I can't, did I do this sutta? Maybe I did this sutta as well. I did talk about the Buddha anyway, the idea of recollecting the Buddha. And I was speaking to one of the senior monks over there. This is a monk of uh, his Danish originally, but now he's, he's more Sri Lankan than the Sri Lankans now have lived there for so long. Yeah. <laughs> he, you know, he's uh, and drinking, he kind of drinks tap water straight out of the tap in, in Sri Lanka. Now, that's fine. You can easily drink. No, none of the Sri Lankans, all the Sri Lankans drink kind of bottled water, but he kind of drinks the water from the tap and everything. So he's kind of, he's really indigenous now. He's kind of uh, part of the community over there. Yeah. And uh, I talked to him about this, and he said that quite nicely. Said that when he was young, and he was in Denmark, he was, uh, you know, he had kind of he's one of these hippies. He grew up in the 1960s. He's almost 80 years old now, 
and he had kind of long hair and these kind of things, and he would, you know, do the sort of things that the hippies would do. The hippies were kind of into spirituality a little bit, you know, a little bit of drugs, of course. I don't know if he was into drugs, but he was into spirituality. And he said that uh, just reading some of the spiritual teachers that were available even then, uh, and hearing their experiences of samadhi, yeah, of altered states of consciousness, uh, he said that made him happy. Uh, that gave a sense of joy, and it gave a sense of joy because he realized that there is more in this world. Uh, there is an alternative reality. Uh, it is possible to realize deep states of meditation, to realize uh, uh, insights into the nature of, uh, of, of reality. There is more than just the ordinary world, yeah? The ordinary world of going through the paces of life and doing what everyone else does, growing up, going to university, oh, so much hard work, oh, look, and then go to work, and get married, have children, and everything is just one thing after another, and there's no time to breathe in all of this, yeah? Let alone think about the Dhamma. That's kind of completely out of the window. Yeah? And then eventually you go on, and then you die, and, oh, and there must be something more to this life, right? Otherwise, it seems so pointless. Uh, what are we doing this for anyway? Uh, and so he said that just this idea that there is someone in the world uh, who has a deeper insight into reality, uh, someone who is able to attain deep meditation, stillness of the mind, the unity of the mind, and feel that you are in tune, in a sense, with the universe, uh, maybe having a profound sense of loving kindness and compassion, and these kind of things. Uh, did that make him joyful? Uh, because he realized, actually, there is more in the world. Uh. But of course, that kind of person that he was talking about there is still only a small thing compared to the Buddha. Uh. And the Buddha has discovered the highest possibility for what it means to be human. Uh. The Buddha has found something that is really extraordinary. Uh. If we think that ordinary life is kind of boring and mundane, it's nice to hear about an ordinary spiritual teacher, the Buddha has found the complete end of all suffering, uh, the highest kind of happiness. Uh, the Buddha is able to give us a gift that no one else in the world can give us, uh, the highest kind of gift to humanity. Uh, this is what is so extraordinary. Uh, and so when you understand what the Buddha is giving us, it is giving us a freedom from all this oppression in life, uh, all the uh, confinement in life, all the busyness, the burdenness that always we are carrying with us almost wherever we go. Uh, the Buddha is saying an escape from all of that uh, is something far beyond uh, the highest happiness, the deepest sense of meaning. Uh, this is what the Buddha is about. Uh. So that's kind of really, really powerful once you start to understand what is going on with the Buddha. And uh, one of the problems uh, with all of this is that uh, we feel distant from the Buddha. That is why it is hard to connect with the Buddha. So we feel distant. In what sense do we feel distant? We feel distant, first of all, because very often we don't think of the Buddha as a human being. Yeah, if you, it's actually difficult to think of the Buddha as a human being. Even I, I mean, I kind of grown up in the West. I didn't grow up with stories of the Buddha being supernatural or anything like that. But even for me, it's a bit difficult to really see the Buddha as a human being. Yeah, he seems something more than that. But actually, the Buddha is a human being. And what he did was just take that human being Nature take, take it to its logical highest pinnacle by becoming a Buddha. But we can all become that kind of arahant, like the Buddha. So there isn't any fundamental difference between us and the Buddha. The Buddha is also a human being. And once you start to see the Buddha as a human being, once you look past the veil, the mythology, the legends, then you can start to connect to the Buddha much more. Because then the Buddha is like a monk you can go to. And you can say, Venerable Sir, yeah, um, Bhante, Please, you know, I have a question for you or whatever. And then you can start to connect to the Buddha in the same way you can connect to Ajahn Brahm or, or whoever it is that you want to connect to. So this is the first thing. We need to understand that the Buddha is a human being. And this is one of the reasons when you read the suttas, read kind of a little bit between the lines. See what is really there. See how the Buddha interacts with the people around him. Yeah, See what is kind of going on in that society see how it feels. And after a while, you start to see, actually, the Buddha, it is very much like a human being. How did the monks and the lay people treat the Buddha? And as I mentioned yesterday, sometimes the monks would kind of dismiss the Buddha and say, yeah, okay, actually, now just, Venerable Sir, just go and enjoy yourself. We will kind of look after this argument. Yeah, they were actually being rude to the Buddha, basically. That's what it comes down to. And you get the feeling that they saw the Buddha as a human being. Yeah, 
if the if the Buddha was God, well, they wouldn't be rude to him probably. Yeah, they probably oh, they're probably too powerful, they're too scary. Yeah. yeah. So the the Buddha comes across more and more as a human being, someone who is approachable, someone with special spiritual qualities. Uh, that's really uh, that's really what the Buddha was. Uh. So this is one way of reducing the distance between us and the Buddha to understand what the Buddha actually was. Uh. And to me, that is much more interesting because uh, if the Buddha is a human being, uh, then it means that what he did was kind of extraordinary. Yeah? He took that ordinary state of human being and perfected it to become a Buddha. That's kind of really amazing. Yeah? But if the Buddha was a god to begin with, then what's the big deal? Gods, of course, they are different. They do weird stuff. Yeah, we all expect that. Uh, if the Buddha had been kind of practicing for four, four incalculable eons to become a Buddha, of course, then you know, purity can be understood. Uh, that is one of the reasons I don't like the Bodhisattva ideal. I don't like it because the moment you say the Buddha practiced for four incalculable eons, then again you're distancing the Buddha from us. He becomes a different kind of being. Who on earth can, can practice one path heading in one direction for four incalculable eons? It sounds superhuman. Right? Already you are kind of elevated to some different realm. And so I don't like that. And I think it's wrong. I don't think that is what the suttas are saying at all. That is not what happened to the Buddha. The Buddha was a bodhisattva only in his very last life because he was intent on awakening. And then he used the human situation, the human reality, to go beyond that human reality and become, become an arahant. And the Buddha, the difference between the Buddha and arahant is just that the Buddha was the first. That's the only difference, really. And so to me, all of these things, they make the Buddha more accessible, more approachable. Yeah? It makes it easier to understand who the Buddha was when we see this. And this does not mean that we respect the Buddha any less. In fact, I think we respect the Buddha more in a way, because all of these other things are just supernatural. You don't really respect the supernatural. You just don't not understand it, so you kind of worship it and you pray it because you have no idea what's going on. And so it's not real respect in a sense. Real respect is something you have for something you can understand, something you can relate to. And you say, wow, you have made this out of your human existence. That's just absolutely astonishing. I really respect that because you can understand it. And so this is some of the ways of getting to know and approaching the Buddha. Yeah? First of all, he was a human being. In fact, this is one of the things that makes Buddhism special. What makes Buddhism unique in the world religions is that it was started by a human being and it ends with a human being. That is kind of, to me, one of the great things about the Buddhist teachings. The other thing that makes um, uh, the Buddha distant from us uh, is that sometimes we feel that there is this distance of time and space. Yeah? The Buddha lived in ancient India two and a half thousand years ago, different culture, different time. Uh, and so we feel kind of, it's almost like a bit mythological. They're two and a half thousand years ago. It's like, it seems like a long time. And uh, so it, everything becomes a bit more legendary and mythological and hard to really deal with, uh, uh, hard to understand. Uh, but uh, again, we need to try to bridge that gap. And the way to bridge that gap over two and a half thousand years uh, is to understand that people haven't really changed very much in two and a half thousand years. Uh, people are people there. Uh, People have the same aspirations, they have the same defilements, the same problems. Uh, there isn't anything fundamentally different between those people and people today. Uh, you read the suttas and you see, what, what did they want? They wanted to have a good job, yeah? They wanted to be wealthy and have kind of nice, um, a nice life. Uh, they fell in love with each other, yeah? And they got married and they had children. Uh, they argued with each other, they went to war with each other, yeah? They were rude sometimes to each other. Uh, they all wanted happiness, no, no one wanted suffering. You, you look at the human condition, it is basically the same. Yeah, there is nothing has really changed over those two and a half thousand years. And so we have to be very careful. One of the dangers is the bias of the mind that always prefers the present. It's called the present bias in psychology, whereby you think the present is somehow has priority over the past, yeah? As somehow we are more advanced, or this is the real reality, and the past is somehow different or doesn't really exist. So we have this present bias, yeah? Especially we have more technology, right? And we have kind of all of these kind of things. Yeah? But actually, all of that technology is just a super, very superficial thing. Yeah? The human heart, the human desire is what we are as human beings. Yeah? All of the things that really matter yeah, are actually the same. 
Nothing has really changed. Yeah, it is the same. And so that distance between us and the Buddha, we can collapse it. And really, we can almost put ourselves in that society. If you were born in India two and a half thousand years ago, if you could switch like now and go straight into that society, oh, now everyone around you, and now you're in India two and a half thousand years ago, okay, the, initially it would be a shock, yeah, because the culture is a bit different. Uh, you have to kind of, uh, I mean, actually, in Malaysia, you have a big advantage. You already eat Indian food, right? So it's kind of part of the diet over here anyway. <laughs> so you have an advantage right there. Um, and uh, so, and my, my point is that. Uh, you go there, and there will be an initial shock because the culture is a bit different, yeah? Even if the Indian food is uh, somewhat similar. Uh, but it won't be long before you feel you're part of that society. Yeah, you will adapt very, very quickly because the underlying feelings are exactly the same. Yeah, you will start to understand the people around you very quickly. Just like now, even in the present day, you can go around the whole globe. It's not that difficult to understand other people. Other people are the same wherever you go in the world. Yeah, we are not that different. Kind of a boring thing to say that there's no difference, but there's the reality of things. And so once you kind of put yourself in that society and you realize that you would fit in very quickly, you start to understand that this feeling of distance is just an illusion. There isn't really any distance. This idea of present bias is just the sense that somehow we are the pinnacle of civilization. But sometimes we are, perhaps we're not the pinnacle of civilization at all. Maybe we are the pinnacle of mobile phones, but mobile phones is not kind of what defines civilization. Yeah, that is uh, not at all. And so this is uh, how we need to think then to bring yourself closer to this idea of who the Buddha was. And now you can start to approach the Buddha. He was an ordinary human being that probably you can relate to quite well. And what kind of being was he? Well, one of the things that he was, he was a teacher. And one of the, and one of, one of these things about the, uh, about the Dhamma, and uh, again, I, I keep on repeating myself in many ways, but I, but I think that's probably okay. But one of the, um, the things about the, uh, the Dhamma, and this is one of the things I would mention in the talk uh, uh, before as well, uh, is that because uh, the Buddha is a teacher, uh, yeah, the things that he says is very similar to when you go to a teacher in school. Yeah, if you go to school and you listen to a teacher, normally you take on board what the teacher says. Why? Because you have no real reason to think that the teacher would lie to you. The teacher probably tells you what they know. One plus one is two. Okay, so you accept one plus one is two, even though you don't, may not understand it at the very beginning. It seems reasonable enough. Yeah? And uh, so, but the Buddha is a teacher just like any other teacher. When the Buddha tells you something, it is because this is knowledge, this is understood. The only difference is, is that the knowledge of the Buddha is far more secure, far more direct, far more immediate, coming from a being with great purity and integrity, far more reliable than any ordinary teacher. You may doubt that one plus one is two because it comes from your ordinary teacher, but perhaps you shouldn't doubt the teachings of the Buddha because they are coming from a very different place. Again, the reason why we doubt it is because somehow we haven't made that connection to the Buddha. The Buddha doesn't seem like a teacher right in front of us, right? And that is why we doubt his teachings a bit more. But in fact, we should do the opposite. We should have more confidence in the teaching of the Buddha than we have at the teachings of a teacher in school or any other kind of teacher. And then you start to think very differently about the Buddha. Then you start to think, well, if the Buddha talks about rebirth, yeah, there is such a thing as rebirth. Uh, actually, that is, becomes then very important because the Buddha says so. He is a teacher with great integrity who tells us the reality that he has realized. Uh, how can you reject it? In fact, you can't really reject it anymore. You have to take it on board. You have to consider it very carefully because this comes from a person who is very special. And so I would say that, you know, as... When people talk about the evidence for rebirth, we talk about all these kind of evidences in the world, and there's lots of evidence for this. Uh, and a lot of that evidence is very interesting, and I think it points in a certain direction uh, and is very useful in many ways. Uh, but uh, the real evidence uh, for rebirth uh, is that the Buddha said there is rebirth. Uh, that is the most powerful evidence of all. Uh, that is the one piece of evidence that is very hard to really just shake off 
Why is it that people don't take that evidence more seriously? Well, it's because they don't actually take the Buddha as seriously as they should. They don't understand the position of the Buddha as a teacher who is actually very extraordinary in the world. That is where we go wrong. And so we collapse that distance. And once we collapse the distance to the Buddha, once we start to understand who the Buddha is, then it actually changes our relationship with the Buddha. He becomes our teacher in a very different way. And when the Buddha says there is rebirth, we take it extremely seriously, because precisely because the Buddha is the Buddha. And so this is how to start thinking about the Buddha, yeah? understanding what the Buddha is about, how to relate to the Buddha uh, a little bit better. Yeah? So this is how you begin, but it goes much further than this. Uh, and before I start talking about the various details here, I will give you some idea. This is the way I normally talk about the, how to think about the Buddha when I talk uh, uh, anywhere, really. And uh, when we say that the Buddha is a teacher, is the highest kind of teacher, uh, yeah, there is uh, two reasons for that. Uh, and the two reasons is because of the qualities of the Buddha of wisdom and compassion. Uh, yeah. And for the Buddha, when he became a teacher in the world, he had no real, he didn't have any good reasons to become a teacher in the world. In fact, the Buddha says in the Arya Pariyasana Sutta that we looked at before, he says, actually, maybe I shouldn't bother becoming a teacher. He has so much hassle, no one will understand me anyway, so why not I just kind of go and meditate and have a good time and, and don't worry about trying to teach those people who are unteachable in the world. And then he surveys the world and he finds, actually, people will understand. And then he decides, okay, I will teach. I will teach why? Out of compassion. Compassion for the world. I have the answer that everyone is looking for. And because I have the answer, I will teach out of compassion. But uh, so the Buddha doesn't teach because he gets anything out of it. There's nothing in this for the Buddha. The Buddha is not interested in the material things of the world yeah, that he might get or people might give him because he's gone beyond that a long time ago. The Buddha is not interested in having many disciples. The Buddha is not interested in becoming famous. The Buddha doesn't even have a sense of self. There's no ego to be gratified or to be, become happy because, because of whatever. So for the Buddha, teaching only has downsides. It only has the downside of the hassle and the arguments maybe that he has to go through, people arguing with him and all the interaction that he has to have with people, all of this, it only has downside. There is no vested interest for the Buddha in teaching the world. There is the anti-vested interest. There's a negative vested interest because for the Buddha, it will be suffering. It will be more problems. Yeah, This is the thing. And so almost all teachers in the world, when they teach, they have a vested interest. Yeah? If you are a teacher, you can, maybe you have a, uh, you have a salary or you know, your students give you something or you get a good reputation or you get, get, maybe you get some disciples or, or whatever it is. Almost all teachers have a vested interest. They have a reason why they want to do teaching. Yeah? But the Buddha, there is no vested interest. There's only one reason why he teaches, out of compassion. Yeah? And this is really powerful. Don't underestimate this idea. Because if someone teaches purely out of compassion, it means that what they say is going to be said out of compassion for everyone. There is no other reason for why the Buddha would speak the way he speaks. He doesn't say it to please you. Yeah? He doesn't care whether you, whether you agree or not with what he says. Yeah? Most people, they, they would please. They would be crowd pleased. They would say something to the crowd just to make the crowd happy or whatever but not the Buddha. He teaches the Dhamma purely out of compassion. And what that means is that when you read the words of the Buddha, they are there because he wants to help you. So read the suttas, thinking the Buddha is saying this because he wants to help me. He wants to help reduce the suffering in my life. He wants to help me to achieve more happiness in my existence. That is the only reason why he's teaching. It means that every word on the page as you read it, is meant for you to help you forward in this practice to make your life better. So read the suttas like that. Yeah, it's like someone, like an uncle or an auntie or someone in your life who really is compassionate towards you and really wants to help you. Listen, this is what you should do. 
Yeah, not your parents, because your parents, you can't, it's very hard to relate to your parents, right? Uh, you never listen to your parents. But you might listen to an uncle or auntie or a grandparent, right? Uh, so, and this is like someone like that, someone who really cares for you. Uh, someone who wants the very best for you. Uh, someone who's only compassionate for you. Uh, do you listen to what they say? Of course you do. Uh, except that the Buddha is like a thousand times more, a billion times more than this nice auntie or uncle that you have. Uh, yeah. And so this is what the Buddha is to you. So when the, when the Buddha speaks, listen for goodness sake. Yeah? The Buddha says, listen, monks, yeah, I will speak. Yeah? You should follow, follow suit uh, and try to hear, try to absorb what the Buddha is talking about. Uh. Why? Because of the power of the speech, because they're coming from compassion and kindness and purity. Yeah? And then, of course, on top of the fact that the Buddha is compassionate, uh, he also has the insight into the human condition. Uh. So he actually knows the answer to the problems. Yeah? So here, this double whammy of insight, wisdom, and compassion is a very, very powerful combination. It means that, of course, we should listen to what this person has to say. Here you are, given the reality of the world on the plate. It's given to you. This is the real deal. This is right view. This is what the way the world works. And then most people, they just reject it. They don't have anything to do with it. It's crazy. Completely nuts. We don't know what we are rejecting. We have no idea what we are letting go of. Truth is in front of us for our own happiness and well-being. And still, we reject it like that. It's crazy. So this is the first thing about the Buddha that makes him such an extraordinary teacher, makes him so special. So when you read the word of the Buddha, remember that. But there is more. Yeah, this is just the beginning. The other thing, which is more, is the fact that when... The Buddha teaches, he actually has us in mind. Yeah, one of those we weird things, you know, sometimes you read the suttas and you think, oh, the Buddha was teaching two and a half thousand years ago and he was just teaching the people in front of him, in the crowd in front of him. But no. And the, the reason why is it's not because the Buddha is supernatural and thinks about the future or whatever. That's not, not, not the reason at all. The reason is that the Buddha understands that when he starts this teaching, it will keep on going in the world for a long time into the future. Yeah? He knows that once he sets in motion the wheel of the Dhamma, that wheel of the Dhamma has a certain power to it. And that momentum of the wheel means that it carries on rolling into the world from era to era, from, from culture to culture, from one a group of people to another group of people. And he knows that in the future, people will be listening to these teachings. And so he knew that when he was giving his teaching. So he's not just teaching the crowd in front of him. They happen to be the immediate people who learn the message and pass it on to the next generation. He's teaching to all humanity, present and in the future. And that is why, when you read the suttas, why they resound with us in the present day, why we can make sense of them in the present day. Because talking to the universal aspects of what it means to be human, He's talking to us as psychological beings, uh, as people who have certain aspirations, that like we have a desire to be happy, a desire to overcome suffering, all of these kind of things. Uh, these are the universal aspects of, be of being a human being. That's why the suttas are so easy in one way. You, when people often say they're difficult to understand, that's because they are very profound. But they're also easy to understand in another way, because they're not bound to a specific culture or a specific time. They have a universal appeal to them. Like it was a cross culture across time because the Buddha knew from the very beginning that he was teaching all people in this way. Yeah, so remember that. Remember that the suttas, when the Buddha is speaking the suttas, he's talking to us. Yeah, he's talking to everyone. And because we are part of everyone, he's talking to us. Every one of us here today is a direct, direct disciple of the Buddha because it talks to all of humanity. And what is fascinating, if you take the suttas, for example, and you compare it to any other religious text in the world, all other religious texts in the world, they are much more bound to a specific culture. If you read the ancient Hindu texts, the Vedas, and these kind of things, you get the feeling that you're entering into the culture of ancient India. And it's very hard to understand what is going on because you have to understand the cultural context. It's like you enter a different world, yeah, different, different culture, basically. If you read the Bible, you get the feeling that you are kind of 
dropped somewhere in the Middle East 3,000 years ago. Yeah, there's lots of weird stuff in the Bible. It's very hard to really make any sense of. It sounds more like parables and mythology than real life. Yeah, and the same thing with almost all ancient texts like that. Uh, they belong to a particular place in a particular time. They are parochial, yeah, parochial, narrow, narrowly belonging to a small area. And this is what, again, makes the Buddhist teaching so special. They are not parochial. Uh, they have a universal kind of outlook from the very beginning. Uh, the Buddha has this large mind. Uh, he's teaching humanity, yeah, not just teaching the people in front of him. Uh, so remember this when you read the suttas. Uh, the Buddha is speaking to you. Uh, he's speaking to me. Uh, he's speaking to all of us. Uh, whether we are here in KL or in Perth or wherever we are in the world, uh, he's speaking to each one of us. Uh, he is your teacher in a very direct way. Why? Because he knew that he would be teaching people like us. Uh. So again, when you read the suttas with this kind of idea in mind, uh, it becomes really real in a very different way. Uh. The sense of someone who is thinking about us, who has compassion for us, someone who has the insight into the human condition, the greatest spiritual master in human recorded history, that is who the Buddha was. And you may think I have a bias. Yeah, of course I have a bias. But I think it's also true at the same time. Yeah? And so this is what the Buddha is. And so this opens up the suttas for you because you start to read them in a different way, with a different kind of uh, mindset uh, when you approach them in this way. And then they start to speak to you and they become much more profound as a consequence. There's much more to be said, but let's, let's do some meditation first of all there. Any comments, questions? Yeah, which one? Uh, thank you, Ajahn, for the refreshing view on the Buddha Nusati. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first question is that um, um, uh, I find that um, the usual epithet chanting of the Buddha, right, that kind of very dry and boring. And yeah. is it really, um, I mean, chanting the epithets, is it really the right way to do Buddha Nusati? <laughs> Um, I, I think it is the right way because it is the Buddha's uh, recommendation for how we do it. Uh, uh, but you have to make it come alive. Uh, yeah. And so in a way, what the thing that I've been saying now, for me, that is just an extension of those ideas. Uh, yeah, It's actually just those ideas that I'm talking about, but I'm kind of expanding on them and trying to kind of get into what they actually mean, you know, as a personal uh, um, feeling, if you like, a personal perception. Uh, so, for example, talking about the Buddha as a teacher, well, Satta Deva Manusanang is one of those teachers, or uh, Anuttara Buddha Dhamma Sarati. Those are two of those things in there, and they are about the Buddha as a teacher. What does that actually mean? How is he a teacher for us? Uh, this is kind of what I'm trying to do, trying to kind of bring out here. Uh, so, it is this, I think it is the same thing. And uh, I think for each one of us, we have to try to think about those things. What do they actually mean? Uh, what do they mean for us? Uh, how does that make the Buddha come alive as a real teacher, if you wish? Uh, yeah. Thank you, Jen. Yeah. Uh, my second question is that, um, I mean, does it help that uh, we can, uh, if there's uh, some sort of uh, book that can actually tell us the story of the Buddha and based on uh, early Buddhist texts uh, instead of hagiography? So, uh, yeah. do, I mean, do you have uh, any recommended books or something that we can read? Yeah, there is, there is a recommended book. There is a, a book called The Life of the Buddha. That was a, the translation by Bhikkhu um, who was an English monk. Yeah. He um, wrote this back in the 1950s, I think, but it's still very, very, uh, uh, very current. Uh, and basically, it's just extracts from the suttas, uh, various places in the suttas that talk about the life of the Buddha. So that is quite a nice, almost like the whole biography of the Buddha from his earliest part until he passed away, kind of in almost in, in sequence. Uh, it's not entirely complete because there are many of the little details like the Vinaya Pitaka that I like to talk about are not actually there. So there will not be everything that you see, but there will be the main episodes of the life of the Buddha will be found in there. So it's called The Life of the Buddha by Bhikkhu Nyanamoli. 
as the name of that book. Yeah. And it's still available. It may even be available for free these days. I'm not sure. You may be able to find the PDF on the internet or something. Yeah. Oh, yes. I, I read the PDF. You have read it already? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's, you probably have one of the best ones then. If you have it, check it out again. Maybe it will be more inspiring next time around. Uh, see Thank what you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. Yeah. If one gets inspired, though, um, PT would arise. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's the idea. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's kind of what this is about, yeah, is to give rise to those good feelings. And then, and then you can combine that with the breath meditation, uh, for example, and then you can make it into something very powerful. Uh, yeah. And the thought does arise in me. And that you know, I spend... Uh, Vasa in Boikaya uh, and Desali. Mm. It was really, you know, special. You could feel a lot of energy. Yeah. Yeah. And so in mean, this one I'm thinking maybe uh Samati will be in the next week yeah. for the play, next place for at me for now, where I will probably ask other, you know. He could need to go along. In Samadhi, uh, the Buddha spent many vasas there, right? Yeah. The most. Yeah, yeah. At the most, exactly. Yeah. 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 So the, it's, you know, when you go, you stay there for three months, you, you know, you learn many things around there in the area. You talk to the local, you know, they still know, they still have the story about the Buddha. In uh, Besali, we went to talk to the, the local. They still know about the Amapali. You know, uh, Amapali? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah they, they, she, yeah. The, you know, donate the, the mangrove grove, yeah. Yeah. the Buddha. And then the local people still talking about her. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and uh, in, in Besali, they also like, um, uh, they talk about, you know, where the castle over there, you know, the building for the the royal people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then they, you know, took us to to the point us where yeah. you know where, where the, those buildings are all it's very, very special. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> this Vasa mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna go to uh with, uh, Sabati, okay, you know, for, for the Vasa. If yeah. anyone interests, <laughs> and you can sign up, okay. You, but gonna, they have to look yeah. for the place, you know, yeah. for them to stay, yeah, yeah, to stay at the temple. Yeah. But there are many uh, Sri Lankan temples yeah. around there, yeah, but there's also Thai, mm. but I have to, you know, make connection, yeah, okay, good, that's a nice idea, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another nice place to stay is Rajagaha because Rajagaha has so many, so many little different places that you can visit. You know, you have the bamboo grove, you have the Jibataka, Jibaka Ambavana, you have the yeah, yeah. Satapani cave, you have the uh, Ijakuta, you have the, in, the uh, Indasala, Indaguha Sala, whatever it's called. That, you know, mm -hmm. all of these things that's around Raj but, Rajagaha has a lot. But not many temples around here, I don't think. I think there are some. I think the most. I think there are temples there as is well. Is that go to Nalanda? It's not far from Nalanda. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I go went there, but uh, it's kind of. Yeah. It, it it didn't look like it, you know. There's many temples around. Okay, I think yeah. I'm pretty sure there are some temples there because it's an important Buddhist site, you know. Uh, so, uh, but uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm not sure. Maybe you have to bring a tent, stay in the tent. And you yeah, have to make a <laughs> inquiry. Inquiry, is it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Ajahn. Yeah. So, just reflecting on um, rebirth again. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm just wondering. I know uh, consciousness is infinite, but who decides um, yeah. rebirth? Uh, how I mean, who decide how are you gonna rebirth? Uh, sorry, how? Like, yeah, who decide? Who decides? Like, who decides wh why you get reborn or, or that no, you get reborn? I, what, what are you gonna be? How are you gonna be? Okay, all right, okay. Who decides that? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, maybe there is no who. Maybe it's just come off. Yeah. 
So it depends on how you live your life. That, that decides the rebirth, how you get reborn. Eh? So this is the idea, you know, when you have talked about the three insights that Tevija talked about yesterday. One is an insight into rebirth, the other one is the insight into the, the rising and passing away, which means how, how that process happens. And it happens according to your, um, you know, your qualities as a human being. Eh? Good qualities, good rebirth, bad qualities, bad rebirth. Eh? Is that what you meant? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, I'm always so curious about uh, the departed ones when we transfer the merits. Yeah. Um, okay. We only have this lifetime to yeah. to send merits to them, so then they will be rebirth to um, a better. Yeah. A bat to have a better rebirth. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So they are, so yeah. So that is the uh, you don't actually just have this lifetime. You have you know this is the nice thing. Here. Is that there's a nice sutta where the, um, there's a Brahmin called Danusoni. He goes to the Buddha and he says to the Buddha, Can we do anything for the departed? Uh, you know, if I give a gift to the departed, will they receive it? That's what they asked the Buddha. And the Buddha says, Well, sometimes they will, sometimes not. Depends on where they are reborn. Uh, so if someone goes to the ghost realm, actually in the ghost realm, you can receive uh, the merits that other people transfer to you. You can receive that. Uh, so if you are a ghost, then you can receive it. If you're not a ghost, you can't receive it. Uh, and so then Danusoni asked the Buddha, I said, well, what, what if, you know, does that mean that uh, if they are not there, that the gift will be wasted, yeah, because no one will receive it? Uh, and the Buddha says, no, the gift is never wasted, uh, because in this long samsaric existence, uh, you have so many relatives who died, yeah, because you died so many times, uh, guaranteed some relatives will be in the ghost realm. Uh, so, yeah, even if it's a long time ago, yeah, guaranteed some relatives from a long, long time ago will be there. So even if it is many lifetimes ago, yeah, sometimes you can make the connection. Uh, and so when, you, so when you make an offering and you dedicate that to your departed, uh, de dedicate it to someone close to you, if they can't receive it, someone else will receive it. Yeah. Ghost to ghosts, yeah, yeah, because the ghosts are connected in a way to the human realm. Uh, and because they are connected to the human realm in a certain way, they can still experience what we are doing here. Uh, Insects can't really experience what we're doing. They are too closed off from that. Uh, but ghosts can. You know, sometimes a ghost will be around in a house, right? Uh, you can hear the, hear the ghost or they will be present. And so they have a connection to us. Uh, and that connection makes it possible to transfer the merit. Uh, so you need that connection, otherwise it doesn't work. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But if they are like a beta, they cannot receive their your merit. That's, when, that's when they can receive the beta. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> um, related to her question. Yeah. So, for example, if my aunt um, makes, uh, to want to make marriage for her son who passed away 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, so, she will specifically say this is for who's the name. Yeah. But if it doesn't go there, it will automatically go to the other relative or should she stay it would it will automatically go to automatically go to the other relatives yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so you, sure. you can but you can say if you want to make it even more specific you can say that yeah for my son or anyone else who is kind of you know can receive this merit yeah yeah hmm. good morning Richard. good morning yeah. um, you know uh, people who are kind of like dying uh, usually I mean, sometimes you do see that they have been converted to Christianity, mm. and this happens all the time, mm. or a lot of times. Mm. So, as Buddhists, what should we? How do we approach a dying person? Okay, you mean uh, how do you? What do you do yes, with a dying person? Yeah, yeah, a, yeah. Just uh, uh, usually, you just uh, one of the best things to do is just to kind of make them have a bright mind when they die, a positive mind. Then. And so you go to them and you uh, remind them of something good they have done. You know, you, you thank them for the good qualities they have, for being a good friend or being a good family member or whatever. So you do something positive to make them feel better. When you die, you want to be in a positive mind state. You want to be relaxed. You want to be at ease. And then the dying process is easy as a consequence. So that's kind of the idea. So go and tell them a joke. Yeah, that's a nice thing to do. <laughs> bring, it, bring it a Brahma along. He will kind of make the day nice. One of the things about uh, just before you, before you uh, before you come in anywhere, just uh, you know, one of the things about this kind of conversion on the deathbed is just Mickey Mouse conversion. You know, it's not really real. Right? 
because you know you you convert because the pressure is on, and so you say, yeah, whatever, I convert. But it's not in, the, in your heart; you haven't really converted. Uh, you do it because of, and so it doesn't really matter. As soon as you're dead, you convert back to being a Buddhist again. Uh, so it's, it's it's fine. Yeah, it's out of fear. It's just a, just a silliness. So it doesn't actually it doesn't really it doesn't have any impact on the person. There's still the Buddhist in their heart. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. I would just kind of okay. But what I would do, I would say that. Uh, the Christian it shouldn't really be allowed into people when they die because it becomes very confusing and very difficult to, to bear for that person. Uh, the conversion doesn't work anyway. So it's just wasting the time, those Christians. I don't know why they're doing this. It's a silly. And wasting the time, but making, making the death more difficult for the person because it's confusing and it's kind of creating all these kind of hassles. Uh, so keep those Christians out. That's what I would say. Uh, yeah, don't allow them in. Uh, yeah, put no Christians on the door, a big sign. Uh, uh, <laughs> Okay, good friendly Christians are okay, but converting Christians cannot cannot go in there, yeah, because uh, it is not is not it is actually not a it's a it's a bad idea. It, first of all, this doesn't convert people anyway, and secondly, it just leads to a bad a, a kind of bad situation when they die. So, uh, yeah, please, yeah. Morning, Anjan. Re regarding these uh, recollections of the Buddha, the yeah. uh, Buddha Nusati we just discussed, how do we use this back into meditation? When I uh, meditate, when to say recollect the Buddha with uh, what just the thing of the Buddha who is uh, not very distant, think of him as uh, approachable and compassionate, wouldn't this become a stories that play in our mind and uh, you start thinking of uh, oh. all kinds of stories instead of becoming calming? Yeah. 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 So I'm creating okay. stories in my yeah. mind. So how does it yeah. play for meditation? Thank, thank you. That's a good question. Thank you for that. Uh, um, so what you have to do is the, the idea here is to build up an idea of the Buddha that inspires you. That's the idea, yeah? So build up an insp inspirational idea. And so what you have to do is you don't do it necessarily when you are doing breath meditation. If you do it when you're doing breath meditation, it will be very distracting, as you say. Yeah? But do it at other times, yeah? Maybe when you're doing walking meditation, walking meditation, thinking about the Buddha. What is the Buddha? Wow, the Buddha has this amazing gift that he has given to everyone. He gave this gift to me, yeah? The gift of happiness, the gift of freedom from suffering, yeah? I am the disciple, I'm the student of this Buddha. These teachings are available now. Wow, that's amazing. That's really inspiring. That's extraordinary. Yeah? And so you build up this idea yeah, at, at any time. Yeah? And these things, like anything else, it takes time for them to become powerful. It takes time for you, before you understand them. Yeah? You can't just sit down and make this happen straight away. Yeah? You have to learn this kind of reflection. Yeah? And once you learn it, once it starts to bite, yeah, then when you sit down in your meditation, all you have to do is bring up the idea of Buddha. All of these other things are associated with the Buddha, and the happiness just comes without you having to tell the big story or anything like that, uh, because you have done all the training beforehand at other times. Uh, yeah? So the idea is that sometimes you need to uh, build up this perception in your mind so that you can use it like that when the meditation comes. Uh, and then you don't have to think a lot. All you do is nudge your mind a little bit. Uh, the Buddha, wow, the Buddha, and then the mind is just happy straight away. Uh, so everything is about training. It's about repeating. Yeah? It's about guiding your mind. It's about turning the su super tanker in a different direction so the super tanker heads in the other way. That's what it is about. Yeah? Yeah. So this method would also work if I use it for the recollection of the Dhamma and the Sangha and uh, like uh, Dana, Dhamma Nusati, all yeah. those things. It all of those. Same method. Same method. You, you want, it, it, none of these things tend to work straight away. And sometimes they can work straight away, depending on what your mind is in the past, what you have done in the past. And so some people, it can work straight away, but often it doesn't. You have to train the mind. You have to do this many times, yeah, and do it. You know, this is one of the reasons I'm talking about this now, because this is a way of helping you to approach this subject so you can think about it in a way which is inspiring. Yeah? But you have to find your own way, yeah? Maybe you can't relate to the things I've been saying. If you can't relate to that, you find a different way of doing it. But then you build up these feelings. But the same thing with sila. Sila is more easy because then it's more, it is something very tangible that you know about yourself. So it's easier. But even that, you need to think about it in a certain way for it to give rise to joy. It is not always automatic. Sometimes it is automatic, but not always. Yeah. Robert. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ajahn, thank you for the wake up call about the perspective of Buddha. Yeah. Never thought of it that way. Yeah. The <clears throat> what can we do to do justice to the Buddha's uh, compassionate teachings? 
how do we read the suttas and all this in daily life? Yeah, so yeah, so the, the way to do justice to it is, um, uh, I guess you know, as I was saying, basically to kind of really put your attention to it when you read it. You know, if you are reading a sutta, really take an interest. Uh, and sometimes there may be suttas that don't speak to you very well. So don't read suttas, just any sutta. Read the ones that really speak to you, that has actually have an effect on your mind. Yeah? So skip a sutta if it doesn't work and go to the next sutta. And then you find one that really kind of speaks to you because you can relate to it. And then really pay attention to what the Buddha is saying. Yeah? You know, get, get the feeling, that kind of see the compassion on the page, see the wisdom on the page. Know that this is talking to you, yeah? This is trying to teach you something. What is it Buddha trying to tell me, yeah? That is kind of the thing here. Yeah? And as you think about it in this way, you kind of make it come alive in a very different way from usual. Yeah? So, uh, yeah, so that is kind of the, uh, the basic idea here, I think. Yeah? It's, it's about one's attitude uh, to these words that is actually very important to make, it, make them work properly, yeah? Yeah. Okay, shall we do, go a bit further or should we, uh, what shall we do now? Yeah. Continue. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's continue then. The, uh, 